Welcome back to the Dare to Dream podcast. My name is Gregory Russell Benedict, and this is a podcast about inspiring you to embark on the adventure of your life. Today, I'm sitting down with Mike Enos. Mike is a certified executive coach who assists consultants in unlocking their potential as trusted advisors. He is a former chief operating officer, chief people officer, and managing director. He's a PhD in something that we're gonna find, about, find out about shortly, and he's the type of guy who has a sign that says, nobody cares, work harder above his squat rack. Welcome to the show, Mike. Thank you. It's good to be here. I think we have to start with that sign above the squat rack. Why is it there? And what does it mean to you when it says, nobody cares, work harder? Oh, man. Uh, throwing that out there right away. It's funny because I actually got in trouble. Um, so f first of all, I I'm a big um, David Goggins fan and uh, navy seals guy and stuff like that right so that's that's where it kind of comes from it didn't come from goggins but I, I can't remember who the original author is it but i ate it up because to me what that means is um a couple of things right is that um we're in control of ourselves right and so no one's going to bail us out um so that really resonated with me also it you know, big fitness guy and, you know, nobody works, you know, work hard, all that kind of stuff. That's, that's all meaningful to me. Um, and, uh, any, I, so I just, uh, I put that in front of my squat rack one for me. And then I have a son who's also big into soccer and all that kind of stuff. So it was also to inspire him, but I, I took it on that, that whole, that phrase and meaning at work as a leader of my company, right. It was, you know, in hard times, um, as the leader of the company, you, you got to step up and literally no one's going to come save you. So when, you know, shit hits the fan, um, you got to get in there and resolve the issues. And, and that, that's really what it means to me is that, is that we're, we have to take control of our lives and our situations. I love it. I love what you said. No one's going to come save you. In hard times, you have to be the type of person who can step up, especially when it comes to leadership. It makes me think of David Goggins, for sure. It makes me think of Cameron Haynes, who carries this 80-pound boulder up a hill every single day that says imposter on it, because that's yeah. his biggest fear in life, is being an imposter or being a fraud. I can't remember what it says on the rock, but I love that kind of ethos. It's things like that that brought us together, and I think that would be a good place to start is telling the audience a little bit about how the heck do we know each other? <laughs> I was thinking of that because I figured you'd ask that question, but I think this is how it happened. Um, so I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. I follow a bunch of people and I think I started following you or somehow you popped up. And I'm like, who's this crazy guy who is doing all these challenges every day and, but, and having fun with it. Like you were doing the rejection challenge and, and I was like, this is, this is really cool. I gotta, I gotta watch this because um, it just resonated with me because I think, well, one is that it, it, there was like this spirit about you, right? Like you're just, you're being silly and, 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 and having fun. That was cool. The other piece was the whole, you know, I'm going to take some risks here. I'm going to possibly re be rejected. And I thought that was cool too. So those two, two things are going on. Um, and so I, 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 I think I just started following you and, and, and paying attention and then shoot, you, you had a post. And then I was like, uh, Hey, Greg, can you, can you, can you send me your list of a hundred behavior or act activities you did to get rejected and that? And then we had a nice little interaction online and then we, um, and then we had a little, you know, we scheduled a, a call to, to kind of meet each other. Um, and I, I, you know, I'm older than you, right? Where I'm like, I think twice, at least twice the age of you. But there's this piece about you that was like, um, you know, uh, you being young, right? And there's this, this adventure about you and like this um, the piece that I really respect and admire. Like, I'm just gonna, you're just gonna go out there and you're gonna try things. And I think for guys my age who've been around for a while, we lose sight of that a little bit, right? We get a little bit more conservative in our ways and set. And um, just the way you were kind of going about things uh, appealed to me. Mm. Well, I receive all of that. I really appreciate it. 
that was what really resonated with me when we had that first call is you were saying that there's the risk or the boldness that kind of gets lost over time when you're building a successful career, when you're grinding, when you're leading, when you have kids and a family, all the things like there's a lot going on in life. And sometimes you lose your own life. And you mentioned you had this one line. It was like, you should coach people my age and help them find life again. And that has sat with me. That has sat with me so much because isn't that what we all want? We want to like find our true life and find the life inside us. So we have that energy, we have that aliveness and the rejection challenges are one way to feel that aliveness. Another way for me at least is to connect to the mission, to the purpose, to your big dream. And I think how I want to play this is let's start with what you're up to now, your yeah. mission, your dream, and then we'll kind of work backwards. Cause I definitely want to hear about your experience. I think it was 23 years going from analyst to partner. I definitely want to hear about all of that and the lessons yeah. you learned along the way, but what are you up to currently? Yeah. So on January 1st, I launched my executive coaching business officially. I got the website up and running, um, working go. with some clients. Yeah. So that was, that was a big leap um, to, to do that. I got certified uh, back in September. So you know, a little, a few months to, to really get up, up and going, um, excited about it because, um, it, it aligns with what I want to do in my value system, right. right now, um, and helping out people, you know, doing what you do, right. You, you, you work as a life coach is just helping people, um, achieve their dreams and their vision for the future. And I don't think there's anything, I don't think there's a better job out there. Uh, um, you know, there, there's no job out there that that I think can compete with being an executive coach or a life coach. You know, to help in those help people in those ways. Um, so, yeah, I'm excited about it. And the, I think the other piece that's exciting to me is like I've always worked in, um, you know, within a company, coworkers and bosses and structure and all that kind of stuff. And this is a solopreneur event, right? I'm, I'm, I'm by myself. And so it's a new challenge to see, okay, can I do this? You know, can, can I, can I make it? So there's a risk involved, which is exciting. Also a little scary, right? Cause you don't, you just don't know, you don't know what's going to happen. I'm throwing myself out there. Right. How has it been so far? Because there is the solopreneurship side of it where you're not with a team. It's just you. There's yeah. also the lack of a set schedule unless you create one for yourself. How has it yeah. been so far in the first couple of weeks? Besides the fact we'll bring in that you and I both got COVID, recovered for a couple of days, and then both got the flu. And we're on opposite sides of the country. We've never actually met in person, but we have been yeah. completely in sync with this, trying to get this podcast scheduled. So you're yeah, feeling crazy. better now? Yeah, I'm feeling better now and a crazy way to start the year. And you know, you launch a business and then two two weeks of the month, you're you're sick in bed literally not being able to move and you're just sleeping. Um, <clears throat> but all things considered, it's good. And I, you know, one of your questions was how do I, how do you do it? Right. Um, like the work day and stuff like that. So I, I, I've actually taken my approach that led me to success in the corporate world and consulting world um, and being very structured. So, and, and so I, you know, wake up super early in the morning I either get a workout in or walk or, or I'll dive right into work depending on the day. But I, I start off in the morning and I have my, my, my day scheduled out, um, you know, with, whether it's meetings or whatever during, you know, during times of day, I know exactly what I'm going to do. I don't, I don't like free what's what's it freestyle it. Right. And it's like, Oh, I don't, this is what, you know, this is what I'll make up whatever I'm going to do today that day. It's pretty structured and scheduled. So that's super helpful. Um, the other thing that I think that's helpful, I, I actually do like to do um, all the parts of the job, right? Like I like the administrative stuff, the marketing stuff. I like to write. I like business development. And I, and I like the, you know, the coaching aspect. So um, there's not like pieces right now that I don't like. And uh, I think that keeps me engaged during the day. Amazing. I wish I was the same. I like most of the pieces. The business development one is still I'm trying to crack. And maybe I'll ask you about that in a second. But what I want to know selfishly 
in the morning when you wake up, you said sometimes you get a workout in, sometimes you go for a walk, sometimes you dive straight into work. Yeah. How do you decide which of those to do? Have you tested all three of them and seen which makes you feel the best? What is most productive? Because I'm trying to figure out, I'm trying to optimize my morning routine and I've made tons of different changes, but I'm curious to hear your take. Yeah. So <clears throat> I know myself that my mornings, I'm, I'm the most pro productive during the early mornings. One, because quiet, right? There's no distractions, uh, stuff like that. So most days I'll work out. And I know, you know, going to bed at night, I'm going to wake up at 4.15. I'm going to get to the gym and, and you know, do my thing. The times when I don't go to the gym and I'm going to work instead is if there's something that's really um, pressing or creating a little bit of anxiety for me. And then I'm like, I need that two-hour window in the period to bang this out so I can feel good. I'll do that. And then after that two hours and I bang something out, then I'll go to the gym. Yeah. Um, so, but, but most, most days it's just, uh, I'll just go to the gym and, you know, you come out of the gym, you're on fire, you feel great. And you tackle a day from there. If I had to wager, I would guess that you go to CrossFit, correct or false? I, I did. I, I was a CrossFit guy. Um, shoot. They're probably going back to 2010 yeah, when it first came out or nine, eight, I, I can't remember what year of CrossFit started, but I was gung ho, gung ho. Um, and then I've kind of, uh, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say chill out. <clears throat> I've just taken it in different paths. Um, and I don't do CrossFit now, but I'll, you know, I'll do similar workouts. Sometimes it's CrossFit, CrossFit. I, I like to do everything. Like I do like heavy lifting. I like running, you know, my, my news, my goal right now is to get back to a sub six mile. Mm. Um, you know, things like that. I just like to, to challenge myself physically. I love it. Have you heard of Nick Bear before? I have. He's a, uh, isn't he a CrossFit guy? He's, he, his like slogan is the hybrid athlete. And he okay. is a power lifter, strength trainer, bodybuilder guy. He compete, he's competed in competitions and he also yeah. runs marathons and ultra marathons. Okay. So I might be following him on Instagram. Yeah. He, he's really big and he's really fast, which is cool. Cool to see he's that you beast. can combine those two. Yeah. Combine that intrigues me. So that's actually going down the path that he's going is something that I want to do. Fantastic. So yeah. you had a successful career. You're now an executive coach for consultants. What do you have your PhD in? I'm curious. <laughs> the the program was called adult learning. I just don't use that because people are like, what's adult learning? Um and so my PhD dissertation was how managers develop proficiency. So essentially it's, it was education, right? It's an education, a PhD in education and how, um, how people learn. That is so cool. It's adult learning. Cause I've heard about adult development. Are those similar or different? Um, adult development. I'm not sure exactly what that would be. So I think it's a little bit different. Adult learning is this, it's experiential learning, how, how we, um, how, how we learn as adults as compared to children. Children learn maybe a little bit differently than adults, but adults, experiential learning on the job, that sort of thing. So for all of the adults listening into this episode, what do they need to know? Like the one, two or three things about adult learning that's going to help them learn the new skills to embark on the next dream. Yeah, it's, it's um, you have to leverage uh, the learning on the job. Um, the informal learning experiences, uh, as opposed to um, going out there and getting formalized training, All right? Because when you learn, when you go to a formal training, go back into the workplace, that doesn't always transfer. It's mm -hmm. got to be consistent and aligned with what you're doing on the job. Fantastic. So, so that's why it's so important for like like people, right, to kind of stretch themselves on the job, right? Take on those those tough assignments because that's how you're gonna learn. Yeah, it's how you're going to learn. And then I think we also share a belief in the value in hard work for the challenge sake. Tell us a little bit about that. It seems like from what I know about you, you enjoy seeking discomfort. Why do you like doing these hard things? And maybe this is a time to bring in the lake plunges that you've been doing. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> why do I, um, yeah, why do I like to do hard, hard things? 
That's a good question. Um, I don't know. I think there's something about there's a, a strong sense of accomplishment, right? When you, when you do something that you're like, ah, I don't know if I, I don't know if I can do that. Right. It's like out there. And, and then you go through that process and journey of, you know, taking steps and, and seeing if you can do it. Like just, you still don't know. Right. And you go through that process. Um, whether or not you reach that end goal, right. And get that ultimate, whatever you're going after, whether or not you reach that or not, it doesn't even matter because you're going to, you're going to make progress along the way. So I think, I think for me, the, the, um, what I like about it, right. Is like, um, you're going to grow no matter what you're going to be challenged no matter what, and you're going to be a different person no matter what, by, by taking those steps. So there's, there's, um, I mean, I, I honestly, I think that's, that's what drives me in life. Like when I, when I look at my life and everything I, I do, it's like I'm the times that I'm on right and happy and filled is when I had this massive challenge in front of me, like this coaching, right? Like starting this, this journey of, can I make this? I don't know. We'll find out. Right. Uh, so that's, what's cool about it. I love that. I love the enthusiasm that you have with the big goal and what, stood out to me is it's less about if you achieve the thing and it's more about who you become along the way and there's always going to be some growth some advantage some benefit from doing hard things yeah for me i've done some hard things and i'm curious to get your take on this it's almost like i did the 100 days of asking strangers for bold things small asterisk i did 66 days and then kind of fell apart and we can talk about that later okay but once you do something hard and you've done it i'm kind of sitting with in this chapter of my life a little bit of resistance to go do a hard thing again because i don't want to fail like i did it once it went okay and now i'm yeah. like oh man if i do it again what if i can't do it this time what if this is the time that i quit does that come up for you hmm well yeah, I mean, so fear, fear, yes, like like fear, failure, all the time, right? That happens to me all the time, like imposter syndrome. That's that stuff. That stuff's real, mm -hmm. right? So yes, I do ex experience that for sure, right? Um, and so it does stop me. I mean, I think I think it's I think it's normal, especially. Uh, so well, well, tell me about that. Like, what's what is stopping you in that in that particular case? It's a great question. I am finishing. So I did, I'll give a little more context. I did 66 yeah. days, almost back to back to back. There was a couple like, you know, Saturdays or Sundays that I didn't do it. Yeah. And I got to 66 and I really lost my why. I was like, man, a hundred days is really long. I've been doing this for 66 days. I feel like I've gotten what I need to get out of asking strangers for outrageous things. Yeah. I want to, I want to make it more in line with my goal, like my big goal of yeah. creating more coaching clients, helping more people. Let me start targeting the bold requests, requests to coaching specific things. And I did that for about a week. And then I just kind of like fell off because mm. this, this is really, it. this is, this will be interesting to explore with you as someone who likes to do hard things. Sometimes I come up against, I don't know whether the resistance I'm feeling is normal resistance. Like, ah, oh, I don't want to get out of bed early. I don't want to go do the hard workout things that you should push through versus yeah. there's resistance and there's something stopping you. And it's actually stopping you for a good reason. Like it feels out of alignment or inauthentic, or you're just doing it to get likes on LinkedIn. Mm. Does that make sense? It's like, when do you know what, when do you push through the discomfort yeah. because it's good for you? Versus, oh, that discomfort is there for a reason, and it's trying to tell you something. It's like an intuition of sorts. Yeah, no, that's a that's a good question. It, when you first described it, right? So I was like, you, know, you did the sixty six days or whatever, and you stopped, and I was wondering, were you just bored of it? That's what I think, but then yeah. I'm also always aware that I might be completely full of shit, and that yeah. I might be saying I'm bored of it because I'm actually still terrified and I don't want to do it more. Yeah. XYZ. 
Yeah. So that's the piece I'm like constantly asking myself, is this legit or not legit? Am I just yeah. lying to myself? The other the other thing I was thinking about, because you started the, the second part of that, which was a little bit more business related, right? And that's different than the first 66. First, first 66 was kind of, you, you, it was silly. There was some silliness and fun to it, right? Right, right. The second piece, there was it wasn't silly anymore. This is business, and you were taking like some really bold, bold steps. It wasn't fun anymore, right? I'm again, I'm just, I'm don't let me put words in your mouth, but it wasn't as, as fun. It was some really scary shit that you were trying to do. Yeah, you're right. You're right. It kind of lost yeah. the silliness and the fun factor. Yeah, and so it became, it became, it became real. Um, I'm guessing. And this, so I've I've had this conversation in my head because I like getting outside your comfort zone, right? You know, thinking about this and I, about my own stuff, right? Like, like okay, Mike, um, you get outside your comfort zone, and I think of uh, okay, I'm gonna do another fitness related thing. That's or I'm gonna do run 44, 48 miles in 48 hours. That's you know getting out outside my comfort zone. But is it? Is it to me? Probably not. That's like my wheelhouse. I'm like just challenging myself physically, which is not maybe getting outside of my comfort zone. And so um, anyway, so where I'm going with this is like um, the things I think for me anyways, I, I, if I'm something that's stopping me, I have to ask myself, what's really stopping me? Is it is it boredom? Is, is it, you know, what is it that's stopping me here? Um, and usually, for, usually for me, it's fear. It's it's fear that's stopping. Mm. Yeah, I really resonate with that, especially the physical challenge example. And I've actually had someone who's a mentor of mine call me out for that in the past because I was resisting something that he wanted me to participate in. I was like, dude, what do you mean? I seek discomfort all the time. I've actually have done that challenge you're talking about, the four by four by 48. Yeah, yeah. I do these things. I love discomfort. He's like, no, you don't. You like doing really hard physical challenges because that's fun for you. And it's yeah. not actually uncomfortable. Like, yeah, it doesn't feel good in the moment, but it's not that really like deep, scary discomfort. And I totally agree with you. I think what stops me is the fear. And the more I reflect on it, I was thinking about this a lot yesterday curious to get your take on this as you step yeah. into the coaching world. I have a huge fear of anyone, whether it's someone I just met, whether it's one of my best friends thinking that I'm being transactional, that the mm. only reason I'm reaching out to them, I'm talking to them, I'm having a call with them is because I want something. Mm. And it's really hard. This is going back to the business development piece. That's hard for me. Yeah. That's been my biggest challenge is building a business where it doesn't feel transactional mm. when you do have to reach out to people because you want to generate leads and relationships. Yeah. But I never want someone to be like, damn, he only is reaching out to me because he wants something. Yeah. Are you reaching out to them because you want something? I think yes and no, right? There's always a reason why you reach out to someone. I mean, maybe yeah. it's a reason like it's their birthday and I want to wish them happy birthday. Yeah. Or you are thinking of them and you want to catch up with them or there's something that you think could interest them or people in their life. Like you created this coaching program and you know, it would be perfect for them or potentially people in their network and you want to share it with them. Yeah. But you don't want them to think that the only reason you reached out was because of that, but there's part of it that is true. Yeah, I know. Yeah. It's a, it's a weird one. In fact, I actually noticed that about your, um, your Calendly says i'm not i forget what it says something like i'm not this is not going to be a sales call mm -hmm. right so you preface for, right out of the gates that your interaction is not about sales with that person which makes me feel better and i stole that from someone else who i saw had that on their calendar and i was like yes that feels really good really authentic but then yeah. sometimes i shoot myself in the foot because it could be about sales it maybe should be about sales and i'm like nope we're not gonna go there like so great to meet you. Like, I know you want this thing, but I'm not going to offer it because you're good. Yeah. You got it handled. Yeah. Yeah. That's tough. That's tough. I, I, so I have issues also with, with, uh, with sales and business, business around that. Right. It's, it doesn't feel, 
if sometimes to me it doesn't it feels um not shady just inauthentic right you feel yeah like yeah. I'm, I'm selling them but i think the way to um uh change that right you got to change the dial a little bit um is to think you're not selling them anything you're helping them i mean what you do is going to change their life and by not having that conversation with them would not allow them to benefit from you yeah that's what i try and remind myself of because the only thing i'm selling people on is their own dream i never that's tell it. them what to do i'm never like we're gonna do this and this and this and you're gonna quit your job and start coding it's no, all man. based on what they want yeah and it's still i get in my own way all the time so yeah thank you for <laughs> diving into the depths with me on that i i definitely going back to where we started i think it is fear i think it yeah. is always fear that gets in the way and learning to parse out okay this is fear and i should push through it or this is another reason like this feels out of alignment with my character it feels inauthentic mm. and that's where you actually like pump the brakes and don't move forward with it mm. yeah one of the things i've been thinking about in 20, 2024 specifically is anything and i keep meaning to write this down so i really am going to be um uh true to this is that anything that i think of that comes to my head that i'm like uh that's a little scary that I just have to automatically do it no matter what it is. Right. Cause wow. like, imagine like, so mm, if I live like that, like on the other side of that scariness is, you know, where the growth is, right. Well, whatever that expression is, but it's true. So any of those things that are like, ah, uh, no, that's not good. I'm gonna, I want to write down and put those on my list of things that I got to do for the year. That feels perfect because one of our previous conversations was about you wanting to do these bold asks, these bold yeah. requests, like bring some of that fun, scary silliness into your own life. And we we're having a conversation like it's hard to think of the things. It is. But it also isn't because there's all those things that pop in your mind that you're immediately like, no, no, please, no. Like, I didn't think about that. Don't write it down. And right. what <clears throat> you're saying right now is resonating with me so much. I literally couldn't go back to sleep this morning. I woke up early and couldn't go back to sleep because I was thinking about going and knocking on people's doors and asking them about their dreams and using that as a way to hear about their dream. And then if it's, if they're excited, if they want to talk more, I can let them know like, Hey, I, this is what I do for a living. I'd love to set up time to talk about your dream more. Oh, wow. Like bringing the, cause I hate the, I I'm so sick of reaching out to people on LinkedIn and doing business yeah. development that way. Like, what if I just face my biggest fears and knock on people's doors? You know, I'm not going to be able to hit a hundred per day or whatever, but it'll be really scary. And I think, I think I have to do that because it's just been living in my head. You do it. You should, you should do it. I mean, that sounds awesome. I would, I would, if you came to my house, like if I know you now, but if some, some person came to my house that you know, you come across as you are so authentic, like and you're a very likable person. If they came back to my door and they wanted to talk to me about building my dreams, it'd be like, have, have a seat, let's have a beer, let's talk about it. Right. I mean, yeah. the worst case scenario is you make a new friend and you don't right. get the same, but geez, that would be that would be powerful. And I the whole LinkedIn thing, I I I agree with you. It's it's a very effective tool. It's just not as personal as what you're talking about. Yeah. Okay. Is much as I'm afraid to admit it and terrified to say this, I'm going to do that. All I'm right. going to go knock on at least one person's door. I'll start with one. We'll get it up from there and do the old fashioned business development and really make it. Hey, my name's Gregory. And I was wondering, do you have any big dreams you're trying to accomplish? Like something like that and just get into the conversation. That is wonderful. Okay. So. I just wrote that down because I I'm gonna remind myself to hold you hold hold you accountable for it and like and follow up to see how it went. But that's the way business was done back in the days. They people would come with encyclopedias or or um, uh, vacuum cleaners and try to try to try to sell to you, right? 
that really is, I think, one of my biggest fears right now. I've been thinking about it a lot. It's been keeping me up is knocking on people's doors and asking yeah. them things. And even just having a conversation, like not trying to get anything out of it necessarily. But I totally agree with you. Like if I go do that, everything I want is on the other side of fear. If I go do that, like maybe I'll sleep better. I won't be worrying about these things. And I love the idea. I want to highlight it again. This is definitely a practice I want to put into place is all of the scary things that pop into your head, writing them down and doing them. Yeah, right. I was thinking about that when I said that. Like I have the reason why it's the list, right, of these things to do. Like the, the things will pop in my head, but I don't I have a place to write them down a lot of times so because I'm out walking. You, you got to carry this thing, I, this phone. Like I use the, um, I've been using the, uh, uh, this is called Memo app or whatever. So I don't lose, I don't lose all my thoughts, right? Yeah. Effective. So what are, you know, I'm going to ask the question. What are some of these scary thoughts that have been popping into your head? Uh, around around what? Around like the things that pop into your head that scare you that you're gonna write down. Oh and you're gonna go oh to. oh gosh, I I wish I could tell you. But I don't I don't know. I'd have to I'd have to think about it. Well, okay. So, um, I here's a weird thing about about me, Greg. I I've had to I've had to public speak a lot. Right right. And by the way, this podcast right. I I probably normally would not do a podcast podcast i'd be like ah, i'm not gonna do that i don't want to what if i'm not good what if i'm not entertaining right there's there you know that kind of um conversation I, but i tell you i did not have that for going into here i was like all right this is gonna have fun talk to greg this is gonna be great right i didn't stress out about this at all I'm not anxious at all i'm having fun it's the best time but for whatever reason and maybe it's the topic i was you know in my former life I would not like to public speak like any sort of the thought of presenting in, um, you know, this is only a one-on-one, -on -one, but in a big setting around people, like hundreds of people like all looking at me and I got a microphone. That's like, ugh, don't want to do that. Like I, it, it just kind of sucks the energy out of me. And maybe it's because I'm an introvert. I, I, I don't know. But um, that to me, that's still a little bit scary. Like getting up to to do like a formal a formal presentation in in front of people. Yeah, that's scary. But just like not 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 my wheelhouse and and not entirely comfortable. But I've done a, I've done a bunch of them. And as a leader of a company, I had to do it all the time. Get in front of it's just um, it, it just it's it creates a little bit of anxiety for me. Right. And I think that is normal. Most people have a fear of public speaking to some degree. It's actually been polled that people fear public speaking more than they fear death, which is wild. Yeah. How did you overcome that fear, anxiety, tension when you were leading people and had to get up and make those big presentations? Yeah, that, that's a good question. And actually, one of the most important switches that I made in my career, when I became most effective and started having a great deal of success in my career was was I um, decided like for a long period of time I had mentors that were just like their styles were like they, the smartest room smartest guys in the room they were just so smart right they had command of um, the topic and they could just dazzle people with with their brains and um, I tried to emulate that. Right. And I tried to be like them and use the fancy words and, and, and it wasn't effective because I was just trying to be someone else. Um, what changed it for me is like, you know, whenever I'm going to talk to someone, uh, do a public speech or whatever, I'm just going to be myself. I'm going to be flaws and all. I'm going to be myself. I can be, you know, I, I can use humor. I, I can you know, share personal stuff so they can relate with me. Um, and then when I'm like that, I can bring out my energy, like my, my passions and, and people are like that, that appeals to people. They can, they can grab hold of that. And so when I started doing that, that helped me out a lot. Like you have to be, you have to be yourself. Mm. So when you started to actually show your true self, kind of take that corporate mask off of, I need to be serious dazzling smart man just take off the mask and be yourself that's when you found more success and more resonance a hundred percent 
Now, I grew up like I'm, I was the first person in my in my family to go to college and first person to graduate. Um, wasn't around the white collar world, right? So I had no idea of wh- how the game was played, right? And so I, I was just trying to watch people to figure it out, right? So that's why I was I was you know being a copycat for a long period of time because I I didn't know I had, like I he's having success, so I'm gonna try to be like him. And um, you know that I learned that that's not the way to go. You you have to bring yourself. And I mean, I swear by that now. Like that, any leader um, has to. You, you can't. You can't pretend to be someone else. You got to be. You got to be true to who you are. Yeah, I feel like there's a certain energy and aliveness that comes when you are being yourself, versus yeah. when you're trying to be someone else. You're spending so much mental energy on trying to be that person and have the facade that you fall flat a little bit. There's not the energy. There's not the resonance. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds like it's a huge lesson that you learned throughout your corporate career. Anything yeah. else come to mind of like big takeaways from the 23 years? Mm. Well, I, yeah, I had some nice, some really good takeaways. Like um, you got to, you, well, you got to surround yourself by people that are, by, that are smarter than you. Right. So I learned that like, if I can put people in places where they're going to thrive, right? And me, I probably would not. If you build that team, right, that's that's a big lesson that I learned, right? It's not about me. It's not about what I can do, right? And then all, all about me. It's like putting people in places to create this team. Uh, and the team's going to have success if you can, if, if, if you do that, right? So that was that was also a big lesson to me for me is um is relying on others and I, I don't I think people don't learn that you know it takes a little while for some people to learn that right it's all because in the corporate world you grow up you're your individual contributor it is about what you do right and that's how you have initial success but as you kind of move up the chain of command it's about what you can get others to do right um so that that was a that was a big learning for me that's super interesting that's actually one of the most common challenges that come up when i'm coaching the executives i work with yeah is they got to where they are in leadership because they absolutely crushed it at doing the work at yeah. having their hands and everything and getting things done yeah. and then now they're a leader and they still want to hold on to all the work but they need to learn to delegate and they need to learn to empower and remove the obstacles for their team. But it's really hard for them to make that shift. How, how did you, or how should you go about making that shift from doing to leading? Yeah. Here's the thing about that. Like that's what happens in most companies, right? You're, you're a high level individual contributor. You get promoted to a managerial position and you have no training at all on how to be an effective manager. You're just throwing it because you're a good IC and you have to figure things out. Right. Um, that's that is a huge problem. And so I, I think, you know, going back, it, it was it's trial it's trial and error, right? You learn from your mistakes. Yeah, because yeah, people will leave you, right? If you're a manager and you're micromanaging them and and tr- you're taking all the the you know the the glory for yourself, right? And not um re- rewarding your employees, people are gonna leave. And so when they leave, then you're like, oh, now what? Right. So that's one way you can learn pretty quickly. Um, and that and that does happen, right? Um, but um, yeah, so I, I forget what your original question is. I think you did ask me, like, how did I how did I learn it? It's just trial and error. Yeah, seeing what works, what doesn't. Yeah. Hopefully not too many people leave, but when they do leave, you take note of what happened. Yeah. You know, 360 feedback tools are actually, this is another way I did learn is 360 feedback tools as an exec coach, right? You, you do get, you, you get this, this information. You're like, well, I wasn't even aware of that. I didn't know they, people thought of me in that way. I need to work on that. So that can be a very effective tool. And I know I had that earlier in my career. Yeah. Many of the leaders I've worked with have that 360 feedback and that's what we base the coaching around. And it makes me think, well, one, I want to get certified in that because it's so useful. But yeah. two, 
that'd be cool to do outside of your job, just in your life, somehow getting 360 feedback from friends, family, partner. Yeah. It'd be really scary and it would probably yeah. sting a little, but you'd grow yeah. a lot from it. You would. Here's something pretty interesting. So I'm I'm taking um and I'm going through a program at Stanford right now. It's a it's a it's a course on power. Right. And so uh it's a it's fascinating. But you're talking we're talking about like getting outside feedback, right? Not just in your in your workplace. And it had like these seven attributes of um that you rate yourself on power, like confidence and energy. You know, there's five other ones. But as part of the assignment was, so I had to rate myself, right? Ambition is another one. But it's like, send this out to someone else, right? That's, you're someone that knows you well and see how they rate you, right? So I got feedback from a former colleague of mine and how she viewed me in these areas. And there's, of course, disconnects between how how I'm rating myself and how, how she's rating myself so it is good to get other people's feedback okay, we're, we we're not what's that i said we got to get a little vulnerable what what were some of the disconnects <sighs> um so i always think of my like confidence wise i think i come across as confident right so but but not all it, it like there's things that stop me and so i rated myself lower in confidence where she rated myself really high in confidence and then the other area was uh dealing with conflict so i was like i could deal with conflict like i like a good fight i'll get in there mess it up i'll, I'll give myself a 10 and i think she gave me like a five mm. <laughs> what where, where did that come from i need to follow up with her to get a little bit more insight on, on what that is but but that's how she perceives me yeah conflict is tough i feel like for myself I'm good at handling conflict once I'm in it, but I will drag my feet and try as try and do everything I can to not get into it. But once I'm in that conversation, once I'm in the difficult conversation, I'm good, but I will put it off. I will resist it. I will pretend it doesn't exist for a while before I get into it. And I think it's just, I mean, I think it has a lot to do with growing up and your family dynamics. And if conflict was common and you could just kind of get into it or if on the surface, things were always good and conflict was more avoided. That was kind of like my family. So it's really interesting. Mm, Yeah. So what else, if anything, are you learning from the program at Stanford about power? Because I know we talked a little bit about that the other day and it sounds fascinating. Yeah, it is. It is fascinating, mind blowing. And and then you, you wonder, is it all just a big game, right? Like, are we playing a big game? In some ways we are like, there's a game within the game that's being played. Right. So, in the workplace, like, again, when I entered, uh, you know, corporate America, you, I just thought you just do a good job, right? You work hard, you do a great job, and that's all you need to worry about, right? It's not the case. And so the big part, part of this power class is, is playing that game within the game and as simple as things like using flattery. Again, this sounds is like, oh, that sounds sketchy and and you know not authentic, but um, it sounds terrible even saying this. But there's truth to it. Using flattery with your boss, like your boss is your most important relationship. If your boss doesn't like you, you're not going to get promoted. Yeah. Right. So the use of flattery with your boss and making sure that your boss feels good, right? those things go a long way. Yeah. And I guess there is authentic ways to do that. There are, that's the way, that's the way I'm um, viewing things. Not that I have a boss anymore, but, um, but, but that, that, that game, you, you can't, that, that game within the game, but also can you be authentic and, and use flattery? Yes, you can, right. You're not just blowing them smoke, right. You're, you're actually, you can say, true things um and and so it doesn't feel so slimy yeah and so now that you're your own boss you're up at 4 15 every morning you're looking yeah. at yourself in the mirror and you're like mike you look so good today <laughs> exactly hey, there's truth to that too right so i didn't do that this morning but 
Um, it's funny you say that. But how we treat ourselves is very important in the, in the conversations that we have, in the discussions we have in our head about ourselves, and setting us up for success. That's 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 key. So that's not a bad idea, Greg. Like wake up in the morning, I'm good enough. Do you? This is funny. Uh, there's. Did you watch? Did you watch Saturday Night Live as a kid? Or I've seen. I've seen some, but I haven't watched a lot of it. There was. There used to be. This goes way back, but there would be this guy. I can't remember his name. This skit. Where this guy comes up, he looks at the mirror, he's like, I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and gosh darn it, people like me. <laughs> that was his thing. But self-affirmation, self-affirmation is good. I completely agree. It feels weird to do and affirmations and all this stuff. I think there's a balance between doing the work and having a stack of proof that you are who you say you are. And then there's also value in cheering yourself on being a friend to yourself because it's really easy especially as someone who gets a lot done to have a really harsh inner critic and there is so much value in being just a little bit nicer to yourself not always not always adopting the david goggins mindset that's true yeah but there's a time and a place for it and so this has been a fascinating conversation. We've talked about doing hard things. We've talked about fear. We've talked about taking off the mask and being your true self. We've mm. talked about power. We're going to move into the end of the podcast and talk okay. a little bit about success. I have two questions for you on success. The okay. first one is how are you going to know if you've been successful in this next chapter of your life with your coaching business? Yeah, the way I've is the way I've been looking at it, right? So I have certain revenue targets that I've put out there for myself. And that is a very concrete way of measuring success is through the amount of revenue that I have, right? Um, so that's number one. Um, and that's you know, that's black or white, right? That's very, very concrete. But to get there, right, the other way, there's certain things I need to do, business development-wise, marketing-wise. So I've kind of set those things out as as well as another way to kind of measure my my progress. Um, so I, does that answer your question? It kind of leads into the second question. So it sounds like there's the objective black and white parameters of, did I hit the revenue target? Yeah. The next question will bring in a little more of what I'm asking, which is, how do you define success for you in general? Like what other things you strike me as the type of person who money isn't the sole thing driving yeah. you. So what, what else is important to you in measuring yeah. your success? Yeah. In life? Think, yeah. Thanks for that follow up there. Cause I think, um, you know, the, the whole, I didn't go into this for money or right? I didn't, I didn't go into exec coaching for money. I mean, it's an, you gotta, you gotta have an income, right. To take care of bills and family and all that kind of stuff. And, that that's just the way it is but um it's about making a difference in people's lives right so um if i can work with people and at the end of the coaching relationship they are in a position that is better than where we started that's that's a true measure of success there so I, I, you know, I, I spent what I did, you know, for 25, I was in consulting and then ran, ran the business unit, but it was in a field that I didn't have a passion for, like the, the subject matter, I didn't have a passion for this and working with people and helping people I have a passion for. So this aligns with I think I started this conversation out earlier about talking about value system. This is completely aligning with my, with my value system. Yeah. What would you say you value most? In life? Mm -hmm. Well, to, to be a good person, to, to do the right thing. Right. Um, uh, to make a, a positive impact, you know, th th those things. I really resonate with all of those, but especially the positive impact. I remember one of the earliest things I wrote down for big, big, big life goals is positively contribute to the lives of everyone I meet. Mm -hmm. Like if everyone I meet is at least a tiny bit better because they met me, that would be 
fantastic. And in terms of move, moving someone from A to B, I'm working with a client right now who's been talking about starting his own business for a long, long time. Yeah. And he did it and he has a product and it's actually sitting over here on my shelf. And it's cool. this facial product you put on, you put on. And it was so cool when I received the sample in the mail of this tangible face moisturizer that we had talked about for hours and hours and hours. And it went from an idea to an actual tangible thing in the world. And it was That's like awesome. in that, in that moment, I was like, I mean, he did 98% of the work, but I'm like, wow, yeah. this is it. Like, this is what I'm here for. That's amazing. Right. Can you imagine if everyone had that mentality that you have and were just wanted to help make people better? Can you imagine the world that we live in? We were all it'd just be, kind of helping people to get better. It'd be amazing. It would be absolutely amazing. It'd be amazing. And that yeah. is a huge part of the mission. And you're inspiring me now. Maybe that's another component of it is doing it myself, positively contributing to others myself, but also inspiring other people to go out and positively contribute. So I love that. That's, correct. That's right. That's a great way of looking at it. In fact, that's how we met. You inspired me. It's, it's, it's true. You inspired me from the other side of the country. And here we are having this conversation. Here we are. Thanks so much for coming on, Mike. Thank you for being willing to do this. It's been so fun getting to know you. I love your energy. I love your pizzazz. I love that we see eye to eye on a lot of things like yeah. seeking discomfort and also being ourselves and being vulnerable and being yeah. courageous enough to take off the mask and just be ourselves. I mean, that's what we were joking about before the podcast. I said, just be yourself. And I feel like that was a big theme of today's podcast. Yeah, no, it was, a, it was a pleasure. And I, I, I really enjoyed it. I, I apologize. I still have a cough from the COVID and the flu, but it's been a lot of fun. Thanks, Mike. And thank you everyone for tuning in with us today. As always, we love you guys.